big welcome to Martin for joining us. A uh, big welcome to everybody else who's come in, which is the, the first Thailand talk of the year. We've had a, a break in January, and we're now putting a program together uh, uh, for the... For, for, Originally, I'd hoped this was going to be a program just going into the spring, but I think the way things are going, we're now looking into into the summer, um, and we'll see how long uh, this continues. There, there always will be some form of Thailand talk program, but it's just a question of how often we can try and have this on a on a fortnightly basis. Basis, but it's very good to have Martin with us. We've had a number of speakers, notably Dr. Pasanti, talking about uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, he's given us an extremely, or two very good accounts, one, one very background account and one current one, and he will be speaking to again to us soon, and I'll mention at the end other speakers that we've got coming, um, of how well Thailand has actually controlled the virus. Um, what would be very interesting to hear from Martin is what practical impact this is having on the ground, because Martin is, is the manager, the general manager of the Lancaster, Bangkok, not the landmark as went out in our, in our, in our, in our, in our, in our flyer, um, but part of the same, the, same, the same group. And tourism, particularly international tourism, accounts for in the region of 20% of Thailand's GDP. And you can imagine, with the impact this is having on the, on the, on, on the country, and more directly, on hotel groups, such as the, the Landmark and Lancaster Group. And it'll be very interesting to hear Martin's account from that perspective. And also as an expatriate living in Bangkok and how, how, the, how the pandemic is impacting on, on the expatriate <coughs> community. But both of those issues will be very interesting. Just like to say, if you keep your questions until the end, Martin will talk for 20 minutes or so. And then afterwards, I hope, There'll be lots of questions to put to Martin, and then we can take it from there. So that's quite enough from me. Welcome, everybody, again. Andrew, if you could please mute everybody, and I'll pass the screen over to Martin. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Done. Okay, can you hear me? Thumbs up. Great. Okay, so welcome. Thank you very much, Steve and to Andrew for asking me to come and uh, present today to the Anglo-Thai Society. Quite the privilege, I'm very pleased to be doing it. So I'm Martin Hurley, I'm the General Manager of the Lancaster Bangkok Hotel. This is part of the Landmark Lancaster Group Hotels here and in London. I've been with the company around seven years now, so three in London and four in Bangkok. Uh, I, uh, I was thinking, I was just checking you didn't want me to do the presentation in Thai, with my kind of semi-Liverpool accent, the Thai, the Thai never comes across so well, but we'll keep it to English for today. Uh, so in Bangkok, I'm also the Vice Chair for the British Chamber of Commerce of Thailand, and I run a Bangkok General Managers Group, which is a hoteliers networking organisation. So I do appreciate this invite, so thank you for taking the time to join today. Um, so I'll be talking about the last 12 months in Thailand, the impact of COVID on tourism, how Thailand's been dealing with COVID, how we've found ways to keep the business running through difficult times. Uh, I'll show you a few of my holiday snaps to show what's been going on in the resorts. Uh, so a bit of a ramble about a few different subjects. So hopefully I can keep it interesting for you. And we'll do a Q&A at the end, so you can just ask me anything at that point. So I'm going to now try to move across to the slides, because you don't need to see me. So let's hope this works. OK, hopefully you can see that. Uh, Andrew, can you just confirm? Can you see uh, my screen and hear me? Yes, I can. See the screen, Andrew. Great, okay. <clears throat> Perfect, okay. Uh, so, uh, I just want to start with some similarities. Thailand and the UK, they've got very similar populations, which always interests me. Uh, similar populations for the country, similar pop populations for the uh, capitals. And as we go through this, there's quite a few other similarities and lots of differences. So. 
That's my hotel, Lancaster Bangkok, sister property to the uh, Royal Lancaster London. I know a few of you here have been my guests and I hope to welcome you, uh, more of you back sometime. Uh, this is my lobby, which is, could be CCTV because that's almost an accurate description of how many guests you will see in the lobby on a standard day uh, nowadays, unfortunately. So to start, I'll talk about last year, 2020 which started really well for the tourism industry here and for my hotel. Uh, 2019 had been a record breaker for Thailand with 40 million visitors. And it was looking like it's going to be another great year with a great January. As you can see from this slide, I'm sure you've seen these numbers again and again, but Thailand really has been a success story of global travel and tourism with absolutely phenomenal growth in visitor numbers year after year. If you look down 2004, we had just 11 million, 2019, so in that short time, gone up to pretty much 40 million. Uh, a lot of increase of new arrivals from China. I'm sure you've all been traveling here for many years, and it just, it really does surprise me to look back. So when I first came, how quiet it was. I first came on holiday the year after tsunami, and just how many more people come now. You know, a couple of little blips where it's gone down in small increments, but no big impacts. Uh, like I said, the, this is country of origin. I know it's a little small, sorry, but I'm sure you can guess the big line is China. So that was 2019, almost 11 million Chinese tourists uh, with a million Brits leading the way for the European market, uh, as you were back, back in 2019. And then quite a busy Wikipedia slide, which shows how China, they went from a million tourists in 2006 to 11 million in 2019. The UK has stayed pretty static. Uh, and then the overall numbers going from 10 million tourists to 40 million tourists. Now Bangkok holds its position as probably the most visited city on earth. And even when Thailand has its setbacks, which we've had a lot of, we've had tsunami, we had protests, the military coup, SARS, we had the big floods, but as it's known as Teflon Thailand, it always bounces back. And at the start of this, I was absolutely sure that this wouldn't be any different. So the first COVID case was found here on the 8th of January. It was the, uh, the first country to report a case outside of China. And you start to see the cancellations trickling in. So just for the end of the month and into February, we started to lose business, but we weren't so worried at that time. Um, and I think we probably had it first because it'd been around the time of Chinese New Year. So we'd had a lot of uh, Chinese visitors that were, were coming in. And by February, business was really dropping. By March, we'd gone down to nothing as the virus spread across the rest of the globe. By April, most hotels had closed. So just a few had stayed open in Bangkok mainly ones like the landmark, my sister property, that had restaurants that appealed to the local market, so it had something of interest to keep it going. Now, the ongoing problem we've had in the hotel sector in recent years has been the oversupply. So between 2018 and 2020, we'd had 6,500 new hotel rooms coming into Bangkok alone, which was about 30 large hotels being into the market. Now, when I say oversupply, I clearly base it on the fact that my hotel was the last acceptable new hotel opening. Oversupply clearly started the day after. Uh, so what have we had new since uh, I opened in no November 2017? We've had a Capella, a Rosewood, a Four Seasons, Kempinski, Kinton, the Waldorf Astoria, Park Hyatt, Hyatt Regency, Marriott, Carlton, and that's just in the five-star space. Um, the new Four Seasons on the river is absolutely stunning. And as you see, they are all nice hotels. And so that's just the five star. Four star have had a lot of openings, have had a lot of budget hotels. So for every market, we've had a lot of new uh, hotels come to the market, which pre-COVID was already starting to show a number of issues. One was on room rates. Hotel room prices here on average is about one third of the price of a London hotel. Now, obviously fantastic for the consumer, but for the hotel owners and operators, it's really difficult to make good returns as the raw materials and general operating costs are certainly not one third of the price of London. And then also on talent, with so many new hotel openings, it's really hard now to train and retain great team members as they'll quickly get poached into the new openings. Housekeeping teams are very hard to find 
And what I found interesting, it reminded me of London in the late 90s, going into the 2000s, where you couldn't get local people to come and work in your hotels in, in the uh, entry level jobs anymore. And that's when the Eastern Europeans come across. And what we're doing now, we now look to Myanmar for our housekeeping teams. So an interesting similarity there. So by this time last year, we had too many hotels, rapidly declining tourism numbers, and the Thai government took the, the start of the uh, pandemic extremely seriously, and pretty much everything closed. So borders closed, all shopping, dining and entertainment closed, everything except food stores and takeaway food, and a complete ban of alcohol, either uh, in bars or to take away. Now we had a 10 p.m. curfew, so you couldn't go out between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. Very strict control measures if you were found outside during this time. So this was a lockdown without any exceptions whatsoever. So during that time, nobody could come in. And then the Thai government set up a repatriation program for their citizens returning home. So they were given a repatriation flights and a free of charge 15 night quarantine, which they call the SQ state quarantine. Uh, this was first of all in a government facility and then hotels were selected to join the program. Now these hotels were generally large, older, three-star properties, what I would kind of call a tour bus style hotel. Uh, two guests would share the room, regardless of whether that they knew each other or they'd ever met before. And I would imagine some very strong friendships were made during this time. Uh, they would get three basic meals today. And the overall emphasis of the quarantine, it was on disease control and practicality rather than in any kind of comfort or mental well-being. Now, this was all under the command of the Thai military, the Ministry of Public Health and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs working together. So for a short time, there wasn't any way for non-Thai nationals to return until one of the international hospitals worked in conjunction with a hotel that they owned and they put in the Alternative State Quarantine, or ASQ programme, as we know it now. So this programme, it followed the rules of the State Quarantine, but the bonus was you could choose your own hotel at a selection of prices to match comfort levels. Uh, the lowest price goes from around £700, and a five-star hotel would start from around £1,500. Now, I've been reading about UK quarantine hotels. I've heard it talked about it a lot, but I haven't seen any definites on that yet, so I don't know how that price compares. Uh, if anyone knows, you could pick up at the end. So for that price, you get picked up from the airport, you get 15 nights of accommodation, three meals a day, so 45 meals, you get two COVID tests and 24-hour medical services if needed. You usually get an hour of relaxation time outside of the hotel every day after your first negative test. Uh, unfortunately for people coming in from the UK now, because of the new strain of COVID, they're not allowed out, for the, out of the room until day 13, and we're not allowed in to clean the room until then. So it's a lot more tricky from, for anyone coming in from the UK. So this program was, was first of all opened up to spouses of Thai nationals, work permit holders and holders of certain visas such as the Thai elite and it's now been extended to include tourism visas also. So our two hotels in Bangkok joined the program at the end of August as it really wasn't looking like tourism was going to return that year. Uh, we can still host meetings and events and our restaurants are still open and we do this by completely separating the teams on the quarantine areas so everywhere the ASQ team go is completely different from any non-ASQ team or members of public coming into the hotel. So it was interesting that myself and the team at the hotel, we kind of really see ourselves as experts in five-star hotel stays, but what none of us had experienced was a 15-night quarantine stay without access to hotel facilities or access to the outside world. So normally if you come stay at my hotel or one of the other five stars, it usually involves going for a nice cocktail in the bar, uh, going to the spa for a Thai massage ritual, maybe a PT session in the gym, a beer by the pool, a, you go for a fantastic night out in Bangkok, you come back and have a great buffet breakfast the next day, go and see the temples, etc. Uh, but with all this completely off limits and a strict ban on alcohol, 
our ability to give a really experiential five-star stay was severely limited. So it was a big learning experience for the team and myself. Uh, and the first focus was on empathy and just trying to imagine how quarantine must feel to different people at different points in the day and at different points of the stay and what we could do to constantly improve the experience. So we kind of looked at how does it feel for a man alone? How does it feel for a lady alone? What the differences are? Uh, families with small children, etc. What are the different things that we need? Because every stay is different and we had to consider all the options. So I spent time interviewing people who had been quarantined in other hotels to understand the mindset and see the positive and negative aspects uh, I met with the British Embassy Vice Consul over here. He'd quarantined at another hotel and it gave him some serious concerns for people's mental health because if you're just not used to being in a room for 15 nights alone, it's just nothing like you've ever felt before. It's so different. I think some people who came from military or oil and gas offshore workers would find it easier, while the rest of us would really have an issue. So we got together with my team and... Uh, and oh, and just to say sorry, uh, this is how, how uh, housekeeping looks now. Everything's in the full hazmat. Uh, it's very hot working in that, as you would imagine. And one of the rules is we have to clean rooms with no air conditioning on. And that's what F&B service looks like now. Okay, so, so something that, that we did, we went back to uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and to see how we could apply that theory to both quarantine guests and really importantly to the team that look after them. So we looked at it's the basic needs, psychological needs, self-fulfillment. So with the guests we looked about how we could make them feel special, feel listened to and understood and definitely not feel like they were prisoners and I was the chief warden. And for the teams we focused on the safety aspects, giving them recognition and training. A lot of the team at the start were really nervous about the prospect of dealing with potential COVID carriers and the impact that that could have on themselves and their families. And we did lose some team who were just, were just worried and were just scared about it. I think the view on COVID is very different in Thailand than it is in the UK. And I think there's a lot more uh, concern in that way. So we did lose some people, unfortunately. Uh, but we invested heavily in the PP equipment and training. We increase labour in some areas, uh, uh, such as housekeeping, because it's a lot harder to clean a room in, in a full protective suit with masks and face shields. And like I said, it's extremely hot. Uh, so we have regular meetings with the team who look, look after the ASQ just to keep seeing how we can make uh, improvements for them. OK, so we looked at guests, what guests need were. We found that number one needs super strong Wi-Fi. Uh, most guests will be working online, Skyping their friends and family, uh, Zoom calling into the office and watching the all-important Netflix. And then food was really important. Uh, before we started the programme, I'd read some reviews of other quarantine hotels where people complained about being hungry. So we made a point of over-portioning from the start because I'm thinking it's probably a little bit drab to be in the hotel room for that long. If you're feeling like that, and you're hungry, it's only going to make things worse. So we absolutely over portion. So we give a good breakfast and then two, three course meals a day. Uh, give a choice of Thai food, Western food, vegetarian food, and uh, religious choices. So I noticed as well, there was lots of complaints in other hotels about single use plastic and the amount of plastic that would go into serving 45 three course meals for one person. So we moved to a biodegradable food container now, food delivery was uh, quite a challenge because obviously all the food needs to be taken up to the rooms hot. So if we've got 100 rooms in, it would be up to 150 to 200 people, each needing a, a starter box, a, a main and a dessert box. And we have to serve it all hot and the hot food hot and the cold food uh, cold. And so we looked at production models, more like how the airlines would deliver food than a standard room uh, in-room dining service. I mean, you know, we can't get them a five-star hotel, so we have to give good quality meals. So we spent a lot of time looking at things like how much sauce you need to put on something, because it will dry up a little bit by the time you get it upstairs and, and to the room. And while it has to be delivered in containers, we thought if you give people crockery and cutlery, it feels a more normal dining experience. 
Uh, the next thing that people really looked at was a means of exercise because it's easy just to sit in the bed or sit in the sofa all day long. So you gave yoga mats and balls, uh, weights of different kinds, and arranged uh, different kind of treadmills and exercise bikes that people can order on request. And the next thing for us, it was generally about being present to talk to guests. Now, normally we could give you a great welcome as you come in. Uh, with this ASQ stay, we get you checked in very quickly, as quick as we can. And so what we do, we let people get settled and in the first couple of days, either myself or my number two would give the guests a call. And uh, just to see how they're doing, how they're settling in, how they're feeling, how, how the experience is, and then it just gives us a chance to ask questions and just to see what the guests really, really need and what we, we can do to make uh, any difference to quarantine. Because it's usually you find it's small things that make a big difference. Uh, we, we had one guest really wanted a dining table so he could separate his work at the desk and his meal in a different part of the room. He said that table was an absolute game changer and it made his quarantine a pleasure. And sometimes it's just if they've forgotten a power cable or a certain brand of coffee or something like that. It's usually one small thing. And if we can identify this and help a guest with it, then it really makes a massive difference. What I'm showing now is a guide that we send to people before they arrive. You notice that if people spend a bit of time planning the quarantine and focus on what, they, what they'll do in quarantine and what they want to achieve, uh, they have a much easier time because they, they really know what they're doing. The people who kind of struggle more is if they come and have no idea what they're going to do for the next 15 days. Okay, and it's uh, extremely strict uh, guidelines from the governing bodies. Uh, so everything that we do had to be uh, put in place with the consideration of absolute safety without any risk of cross-contamination. Now there are about 100 hotels in Bangkok on the ASQ scheme with uh, very different levels of success. Any hotel that has opened without quarantine, they absolutely rely on domestic tourism markets, weekenders and staycations. So as you imagine, there are some great offers here at the moment with all levels of luxury. Um, a comparison that I'd make to the UK, if you look at London and Bangkok, is that the people from the provinces don't really come to Bangkok the same way as people from the north might come down to London in England. Uh, domestic tourism here, it's more about islands, resorts and the northern cities rather than head for the capital for theatre and sightseeing as people do in the UK. <clears throat> so once you've gone through your quarantine, what can you do next? So uh, outside of Bangkok, the nearby drive to destinations have been quite successful, uh, mainly Hua Hin and Pattaya, along with Kanchanaburi and Khao Yai. And I think you have the same thing in the UK where people like the comfort and safety of traveling for a few hours in a private car. And for here, it's just a lot more preferable than being on a crowded airplane. It feels a lot safer. Uh, Pattaya, it's really interesting to see the change of uh, guest profile there within the last year. It was always known as a bit of a sin city and the Thai people didn't really like to go there particularly. Uh, the reputation came from the European tourists, the Chinese, and more recently the Indian tour group markets. Now, without those guests, Thai families have started to arrive for weekends away. And with less tourism, Pattaya Beach looks great, the sea's blue again. Uh, North Pattaya part is now becoming a real family destination, and more hotels have opened there, really designed for the family market with water parks, kids' clubs, large family rooms. And at the hub of all this, there was the new Terminal 21 shopping mall. So you can really bring the family to Patsy now, you know, less than two hours outside of Bangkok, stay there, eat, drink, shop, and enjoy the beach without seeing any of the uh, traditional sunburnt men in Chang vests. And it'll be really interesting to see what happens with Patsy in the future, because I could imagine a more smaller contained entertainment zone and a, just a lot more of a family focused seafront. Uh, Sriracha which is a deep water port town just over an hour from Bangkok, has become an unlikely tourist destination with new hotels opening around a marina, uh, with speed boats to the nearby Koh Si Chang Island. So in a short trip from Bangkok, you can get a bit of a feel of the islands and drive there yourselves. So all the main drive-to destinations start to see good occupancy rates when the lockdown was lifted. 
So from June, you could start to get alcohol again. You could go out to restaurants, a lot more things opened up. And it, we, we just had a lot more normality for the following six months. So in the hotels not far away, you would see 100% occupancy at weekends and a decent 20 to 30% midweek occupancies. So you get the pleasure of seeing some of my uh, holiday snaps now. And what I really notice about traveling around Thailand is the ecological impact of COVID. Without having thousands of people touring around, uh, you, you really see that, that the beaches have improved, they're a lot cleaner, the water is bluer than I've ever seen it, uh, sunsets you see a lot better with a lot less pollution from traffic, it definitely looks better. Uh, the resorts and islands further afield haven't quite done so well. The main resorts of Krabi, Koh Samui, Kaolak and Phuket are all struggling. A lot of things still closed. Uh, when I visited Kaolak, that's the resort uh, very popular with Europeans that was badly, badly hit by the tsunami in 2004. And it does look a lot like another tsunami's hit. You see all the small shops and restaurants in the town and it looks like the owners just grabbed what they could and, and ran. You'll still see outside shops, shoes left outside, but the shops all cleared up. And it's just like uh, they just took the opportunity to grab what they can and leave. Now, in Kaolat, TripAdvisor used to list 214 restaurants. When I went there in November, I think there's about 10 restaurants still surviving. So difficult times. So in Kaolat, very popular with the Europeans, you can now get a deck chair at any time of day without any problem. So you don't need to get up early and put your towels out. Uh, here's some empty beaches. That's my kids looking for the tourists. Uh, like I said, without any traffic pollution, the sunsets look like I've never seen them before. Uh, so going to resorts, the dry shoes, that's on the left. It's uh, the very nice Renaissance Pattaya. As you can see, no guests at the midweek and a very blue Pattaya sea behind. And that on the right is a resort uh, in the mountains by Qua Hen. Like Qua Hen, sorry, looking very beautiful, but again, no tourists. Uh, this was, I went out on the boat. Now, that isn't a filter. The water really looks that blue now. Uh, it looks fantastic. So that's just outside Krabi province. I went to Aonang. Similar story. <laughs> Some resorts can do okay, and same in Phuket and Koh Samui. You get a couple of places doing okay, but on the whole, quite desolate and very empty but rather clean beaches in Krabi. The northern cities of Chiang Mai and Chiang Rai, they were showing good numbers from domestic Thai tourism uh, until the recent spiking cases at the end of December, because we're having a light lockdown now. So to update on where we are now, after six months of virtually zero new COVID cases, we saw a spike at the end of December, which seemed to be linked to a, uh, the seafood processing plants down in Samut Sakon, which is about 45 minutes to the west of Bangkok. The story is a lot of migrant workers had managed to sneak across the border, bypassing quarantine, and the outbreak is mainly centered around the factories and plants in that area. Now, the daily numbers do seem big for Thailand for new COVID cases. We're getting around 800 a day, but I guess for a UK audience, that seems like very low numbers. But what the government seems to be doing is actively targeting and testing in these areas to quickly slow the infection rate. And they're doing a great job so far. Uh, we have the light lockdown, like I mentioned, which is no bars, no nightlife, no alcohol sales in restaurants. They close the gyms and the spas for a short time, but they're now back in operation with some restrictions on numbers and an enhanced uh, hygiene protocol. The shops are all still open. We can have conferences of not more than 100 with social distancing. But quite a contrast from back in mid-December, we held the British Chamber of Commerce Christmas lunch and could have 500 people in the ballroom and a good amount of uh, wine and fun. Uh, with no problems and really with the chamber we hope to get back to large functions and events later this month if the infection numbers continue to drop but that's how it's looking so a little bit of a step back but overall quite positive and still not that many deaths so this is a very brightly colored slide which shows the uh, december going into january and you can see from that uh, some nights in december hua hin was hitting 75 percent occupancy passing at around 68 uh, Samiri Krabi in Chiang Mai, 
did a decent 50% occupancy up to New Year's Eve before the slump due to our second wave. Now, I'm guessing you're looking to the future and when normality might return. So, and how things uh, will be different when you can next all come on holiday and business trips without quarantine. So that's, I think, the kind of future of a check-in will be a mask and a visor. Uh, I mentioned earlier, masking in public is the only way forward now. Wherever you are, if you're outdoors or in a restaurant, when you come in, you're expected to wear your mask until you get seated at your table. Um, if you go to a hotel and the buffets, we have the buffets, but the expectation is you'll wear your mask, you'll put plastic gloves on when you're helping yourself to the food. And I can't see any end to that really for the, for the uh, foreseeable future. But overall, I think no huge differences, no huge differences. So like I mentioned, and you all know well, Thailand is a country of mass tourism. Uh, Bangkok, as you see from Google, still listed as the most visited city on earth. Now, it's hard to get exact numbers on this, but I researched this, and similar to how Steve said earlier, tourism accounts for about 20% for the GDP. Uh, there are about 9 million people directly in the Thai tourism sector. And apart from just working frontline in tourism, there's all the ancillary industries related to tourism, such as the supply of food, drink suppliers, hotel consumer suppliers, the people who supply our security, the guys who go out fishing to put shrimps on our buffet, uh, which I think you would estimate that to be about 18% of the Thai population. So the sector, it's of high value and a major employer for the country. Now, as a contrast to that though, the general sentiment of the Thai people is to keep the safety as the number one priority. The last survey that I read suggested that around 75% of Thais don't want to reopen to mass tourism anytime soon. And I would guess the remaining 25% probably work in tourism, so that's why, why they uh, feel differently about that. And what I think is very different here, catching COVID seems to have a real social stigma. As if, if you caught COVID, it's because you weren't following the rules or you're being careless. And when I've spoken to people who thought they might have had it, there was a real embarrassment around it rather than it just being something you picked up because you were in the same area as someone else. So I had been doing some predictions about uh, will quarantine shorten to seven days and just have one test rather than two. And then we had some breaking news yesterday, as of the second, that the Ministry of Tourism and Sports wants to open up without quarantine to vaccinated, vaccinated people from May at the latest, he said, and inoculate the people who work in tourism as we are classed as frontline workers. Now, alongside this, the Tourism Authority of Thailand wants to work on a standard vaccine passport for the 10 ASEAN countries and, of course, China. And so I'd imagine quarantine would have to continue for people who haven't been vaccinated or take a choice not to. So it's positive news that we've never heard before from the ministers that April, May is the time that they want to start welcoming people back and they're hoping to get 10 million tourists in the country this year, which is a quarter of what we had back in 2019. But it's certainly a start and would be a real help to the industry. So I hear a lot of, or I read a lot of online comments that the Thai people are very over the top with their protective measures and they should lighten the travel restrictions. Obviously, all of us in hospitality want it to be easier for people to get in. But I've yet to see a country that has really successfully managed their reopening. I've seen lots of destinations around the world open up and then close down when the numbers get high. It's an absolute fact that global travel does bring more COVID. And I see all the comments regarding the party goers in Dubai in December and the negative impact that had when people returned home. So to go back to the comparison of UK to Thailand and, and add the kind of sad an unfortunate death toll, it really gives clarity about reluctance to open the borders when you compare two countries of very, very similar populations and the COVID death numbers between 79 and 107,000. So it really gives me the feel as to why that the Thai people are very reluctant to open up to mass tourism as it was. So I will end with a quote from uh, Judy Chalmers, wish you were all here. And the message is that we want you back. 
the Thai tourism industry desperately misses you all and we are ready to welcome you back as soon as we can. So we'll go on to Q&A now if I can uh, stop my slides one moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. I mean, that was a, <clears throat> a, a very, very useful account and uh, it's good to hear it from a, from a tourism or a hospitality perspective. <clears throat> I think your last point is a, is a very important one, the comparison between um, the situation in the UK and Thailand, because I think while Thailand is, is sort of, uh, Thais themselves are clearly very concerned about opening up and what that will bring, it would make sense looking at the, the current track records of fellow ASEAN countries, and particularly China, you can see the importance of China on the tourism side, of wanting to get more travel within ASEAN as, as, as a starter. Um, I think from our own perspective and, and other countries with, 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 with uh, still battling very hard against the pandemics, <clears throat> like the USA, until there is a clear sign that our numbers are, all our numbers across the board, are dropping, you can see why countries such as Thailand are reluctant to allow Brits to come back in again. I mean, there's been talk about, and I'm sure this will come in at some point, uh, having vaccination passports and enhancing uh, what people, what documentation people have to show before they travel. So people are more confident about traveling in, in, in itself. I mean, the big issue there, as we've already seen with things like PCR testing is great that the PCR testing process itself um, uh, PPP people ha have confidence in but what that tends to bring is people then counterfeiting PCR test documentation and you can counterfeit uh, uh, vaccination passports so although the principle is, is, is one that's a sound one and worth building on if, if you then then find people taking advantage of it the whole credibility of the system then goes it will be on, on, on the aspect of uh, uh, if, if, if we allow people to come into the country, are, are, are we going to see, see a sort of a, a third wave or a fourth wave or what, what, whatever it may be? Um, but things uh, hopefully we're seeing in the UK are progressing. It is too early to see the impact, although many of the signs we're getting are, are positive. That trend needs to continue. Um, but we, I think a lot of people who are watching this today are very, are very keen to start travelling again. Indeed, travel to Thailand itself. I mean, that, that's, that's somewhere where many of us have been away. I mean, the last time I was there with a number of people who are watching today was with our, our regional tour, which took place in February last year. Um, by the way, it's looking, I think, this year may well be the first year in about 20 that I haven't visited Thailand, although we do have a, a regional tour visit planned for March next year. And that's one which people are looking at, thinking that actually there's, there's a good chance of that going ahead. I certainly hope there is a good chance of, of that going ahead, but we just have to monitor developments. But r rather than me go on, I think what I'd like to do is throw the floor open. Hopefully there's lots of questions for you. Um, and, 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 and to see, I mean, <coughs> just one, one final shot for me. We, I had a chat with Martin yesterday. I mean, what was an interesting comment that came up was that actually amongst the sort of resident expat community in, in Bangkok, Martin was hard pushed to think of anybody who'd actually had uh, COVID, which is an interesting fact in itself. Not that we're in any way immune from it, but the fact that that's not a known quantity in the expat community in Bangkok is quite a large community. It's not, it's not small by any means. And you touched on how successful the BCCT lunch was in December with 500 people there. But the, those are the sort of events that if, if this was going to come out, you would have expected to have heard something as a result of that. But that, that's an interesting aside. Let, 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 me, let me pass the screen over to anybody else who's got questions. I hope there's lots of questions for Martin, but thank you very much. I'll come back in again at the end. Thanks, Martin. Thank you, Steve. That's Sally. Yeah, I have a question, if that's okay. Uh, Martin, I'm really jealous of you being able to run your events again. Um, there was a period of time before the government went into this lockdown uh, where they had said that we could run events if it was 50% of our fire and safety capacity and if we could still be socially distanced, which enabled me to move from what had been a 30 restriction 
to like 150 or 200. Were you given any restrictions at all that you had to adhere to or were you able just to go back to your old way of, of running? Well, it went piece by piece, Sally. And so, and it's doing a similar thing now where if I have an event now, it can be less than 100 people and we need distancing of 1.5 metres. And we can't serve a buffet. We have to serve a kind of box meal where everyone has individual. And, you know, it's really interesting that uh, we will put on, a, on an event like that and we'll sit everybody separate and the first thing they'll do is they'll drag the chairs across and sit next to each other and we put out the individual food boxes and they say, is there no buffet? <laughs> uh, and, and what was interesting coming out of the last lockdown where we were kind of going through stages until we could do a standard event again, it was really decided on what the people wanted. So we could give all suggestions, so we could say, do you want distancing, do you want uh, individual services, things like that. And they really wanted to get back to normal. And I think that feeling of the people really drove the, uh, the standards to change. Mm. So uh, in the last couple of weeks since our, we had our little second wave, we started to have conferences again. Everything cancelled at first, but it started to come through. And I think uh, by the end of the month, we'll be pretty much back up to normal. But it was uh, similar to uh, one and a half metres kind of drops you to 50% of your capacity and smaller meetings you just put into a bigger room to make up for it. Okay, so similar. Thank you. Yeah. More questions? Peter. Peter Bradley. Hi Martin, thanks, thanks very much. Um, it's, it's great to see that you and the team are doing well and uh, I, I just really wish I was able to, to be out and experience uh, your hospitality. Well, one thing that struck me though is um, it's great that the hotels are, are doing such marvellous work but we have to get to Thailand and I'm just wondering what are the hoteliers uh, doing in with discussions with the airlines because that is a, a major fear of the safety getting across to Thailand in the first place. Um, and obviously you've got some great things in place that possibly the airlines would learn from. Is there any discussion at top level? Uh, I have engaged with some of the airlines and I was lucky that one of the leading airlines, uh, the country manager came and quarantined with me. So he was trapped for 15 days with me. So I could kind of pick his brain and ask him about uh, protocols and how they're doing things. But I think um, that, that would always be the biggest worry because we have had people in the quarantines where they had a test before they left and by the time they got here, they had COVID. And the chances are they got it from the airport or the airplane. Uh, so we, we talk with our lines. Uh, we, we try to work together in the way of uh, promoting uh, if you buy the, the airline ticket, you can then come and stay and get some discounts off the quarantine and work together in that way. But that, that's about as far as we've gotten with it at the moment. I think that they're having such a struggle. It's interesting when I've seen people who come across on Thai Airways where the, there's no TV anymore because they say, you know, we're in financial trouble. We can't really afford to put that on. And there's no alcohol uh, for that same reason, not because of any kind of ruling about COVID. Uh, they, they just say they're not in a position to, to offer the services that, that they used to have. So I hope that kind of answers the question. And Peter, we miss you. You were one of our great regular guests whenever you came over. It was always great to support uh, the Safe Child charity. So I can't wait to see you back over here again. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Uh, we've, we've got uh, uh, several conferences planned this year, so hopefully we can um, be uh, across... Uh, sooner rather than later. Thank you. Okay. Don't like it. Uh, really interesting presentation. Um, I just want to make a comment about the part of the result on guests who arrived who had a prior P PCR test. Um, it would depend also on how they were tested before they left. In the UK, there are kits that are being uh, sold so uh, passengers can buy it online. The kits 
get sent to their home and they have they do their own test. Can you speak up a little bit, John? It's a little bit faint. Just, just okay. speak up a little bit. Um, depending on how they do that test, whether they put it up their nose adequately or whether they put up their ears or anything else, there's oh, no the cat. authority knows. Yeah. So that's a way of passengers who want to really go can bypass that system. And I'd be interested whether those so-called positive tests um, in Thailand and negative in the elsewhere was tested at home that way. The second point is there are not that many um, proven um, passenger um, who have contracted the COVID whilst at least on the air, in, in the aeroplane. Very, very few instances. Um, the other point I'd just like to make for all the audience here is that um, it, the PCR test, if you're going to go to Thailand, do choose the companies carefully because some claim that they will give you both um, a COVID test result as well as a fit to fly. And they don't always do that. And I've had so calls regularly on Sunday mornings now at about between eight and nine to give passengers an emergency fit to fly certificate. So, so all I would say is just ch check your uh, source of PCR tests carefully. You know, John, I, I read a lot of comments on the, all the Facebook sites, like the uh, Thai expats stranded abroad, etc., And I hear that if your certificate doesn't have the words fit to fly, you just can't get on the plane. And I, I've spoken to a lot of people who had a very, uh, what would you call it, <laughs> very sticky moments when they got to the check-in desk and something was missing such as that, which is why you get, you get the calls, because they've done everything, they've got certificates of entry, they've done every part of it, and I, I think the airlines have been told strictly, if you don't have uh, paperwork one to five in the exact order, you're not getting on, regardless. Yeah, that's right. And that's despite mm. it being advertised that they provide the fit to fly certificate. Yeah. Yeah. I had a family of five coming in uh, from Europe and they, for some reason, something was wrong with the paperwork. Uh, they got stopped. But because it was a, I think, a late night Friday flight, they then couldn't contact the Thai embassy until the following Monday because then your certificate of entry has the wrong date on it and everything else is out of line. Then the, uh, the PCR test was then older than 72 hours before boarding. So it can be an absolute nightmare if you just don't have that fit to fly. And I think the fit to fly doesn't say you haven't got COVID or any other reason. I think it's, it's like just a basic medical test, yeah? No, it, it really isn't a fit to fly certificate. It's more, um, you haven't got COVID symptom certificate. Yeah. Because uh, strictly speaking, a fit to fly should be a full assessment of your cardiovascular and your respiratory system. So it's a misnomer. John, I'm, I'm guessing you're in the medical profession. I am, yes. yes. That's why I'm able to give him urgent fit to fly certificates on a Sunday morning when I get yeah. woken up. <laughs> <laughs> Free of charge, I hope, John. <laughs> Some instances I do, yes. Um, there was a Thai lady on Sunday who, was, who paid for a certificate for a certificate and she paid, I think, £149. Yeah. One, she didn't actually need it. And two, um, she was desperate. So I, 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 I provided that for her for free. I, I think it's a good point, John, you raise about PCR because PCR testing, was, was, there were relatively few providers not so long ago, but they, they'd mushroomed and... Uh, and the costs also reflect that. I mean, I've, I haven't had a PCR test, but I've booked uh, many uh, and I've never had to have them because my, my various trips have been canceled. But it's quite interesting with the companies that you deal with, some are clearly far better than others and also far better about funding you as well, which is, is interesting. But uh, um, uh, so I think some of the airlines, British Airways now have recommended PCR providers, but you do need to be very selective. And it's the old adage that you get what you pay for. So be very careful, just getting a, the cheapest one out there. Um, if you get your result back in time, you've done very well, never mind anything else. But uh, that's a very good point. Just go back to something else, Martin, that you said. It was interesting 
that government ministers are now openly talking about possibly opening up the, the sector and opening up the borders. I mean, I, I, I saw the other day um, that Bill Heineke, who's the, who's the, uh, the chairman of Minor International, who's a very large uh, Thai, Thai uh, hotel group and service sector group, do you think that the, the latest response is anything to do with the letter he wrote to the Prime Minister because uh, of tourism being such an important sector in Thailand? Or is this just the way that the, the government's thinking is? This may have just been a gentle nudge to, to put, push the, the government to be a little bit more open about when they see the borders possibly opening. Well, what, what I found is interesting about that, his letter, and I think he does write a lot of letters to the government. He's a He's a regular for that, and he uh, fights for the cause for uh, us hoteliers. But he, he made the suggestion of the hotel workers being vaccinated yes. as yes. frontline workers. And then the tourism authority uh, said a very similar thing that it could have been coincidence, I'm not sure, but it was within a couple of days of one another. So it's, it is interesting. And, and his, his point's a very valid one because um, as John just said before you about PCR testing, I mean, people coming to Thailand, they, they want to have the reassurance they're, say, they're staying in a, in, a, in, 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 a, in a hotel that abides by all the COVID, um, the COVID regulations. So you, you need to really have a um, confidence in, in A, the airline, where you're going to be staying, um, and, and all, all this needs putting in place. So, so there's, a, there's a lot of work to be done on both sides. But It'll be very interesting to see how, how, how things proceed. I, I think very much on the, the ASEAN regional approach, I hope to see some movement there because I think one, one, of, one of the big problems that Thailand's facing, and not just Thailand by itself, are other countries that have taken similar approaches. And I put New Zealand and Australia in this category where in a sense, one of my previous postings was in Korea. Where when I went there, it was a hermit kingdom where it was very difficult to get in and out. And that's really what you create. Once you, once you shut your borders down, in, in effect, that's the easy part. Opening them is the, is the, is the biggest problem you have. And, and countries even like New Zealand, Australia, you can see there's a big reluctance. Australia is not, it's openly saying it's not going to open its borders again, except for selected travellers, which may well include New Zealanders, until the end of the year. They've already come out with that statement. So you can see the dilemma that Thailand is in. But it'll be very interesting to see how things progress over the next few months, particularly on the ASEAN regional approach. And if that goes ahead and if that goes well, I can then see that being opened more to, to, to the likes of Europe and, and North America, which is really where, where we are. For ourselves, although we're all, I think, itching to travel, we, we fully understand why we, why we can't travel to, to Thailand at the moment and, and really want to see some, some positive progress on our own front, which in turn will give the Thai government more more confidence in allowing us back in again but it's a it's an interesting stage at the moment where hopefully things are going in the right the right direction and we will be able to follow suit but i think thailand really does need to open up regionally and then build on the back of that you know just to the point uh, that you made at, at the beginning and uh, john mentioned about the uh, uh people not doing a, a covid test correctly uh, apart from the hotel being the right hotel and the airline being a good choice it's also the partner hospital, because all these yes, yes. Uh, hotels have to partner with a hospital. And the thought that if, unfortunately, you did come here and have COVID, is that hospital at a certain level that they can look after you, really? Because uh, there is a, a variance. I mean, we chose a good hospital, Pierrevet, and they have some uh, groundbreaking treatments where they say that they have taken plasma from people who have previously had COVID and they use that to put a, a treatment together, which they say is better than what Donald Trump has. Now, I was thinking how I could put that on my marketing, to say, come and get treated better than Trump. I don't know how I can, how I can really make it land well. Uh, but it's interesting that which I, people will go for a cheaper quarantine and I can understand that, but I think you have to keep your mind, well, uh, we pay uh, we pay a big fee to the hospital. If you go for a lower hotel, they come to pay the big fee to the hospital because they couldn't make it add up. So then, what's your level of care going to be if the sad fact yes. of COVID? Because, like John said, if people are doing self tests and they don't quite do it correctly, 
then they are running the risk of when yeah. they get the first test in the hotel that they may have it. You then get whisked away to the hospital and you, you, you're in their hands then until uh, you can test negative over a period of time. So it's yeah, about it's having that it's aspect. It's the whole process. It's the whole process, Mario. But well, that's, that, that's equally important. And any more any people queue in the question queue, Andrew? No, but Tim Isaac raised a point on chat, and I wonder whether he'd like to put it directly to... Yeah, uh, please, please do, Tim. Please do. Um, I, have I unmuted myself successfully? Yes, you yes, have. Yes, I can hear you, Tim. Okay, good. Um, it was merely talking about the um, Barbados precedent, if you like, or example, where um, I understand that what, what has been happening for a while there now is that certainly you have to have a... Um, a test and it has to prove negative before you get on a flight. Um, however, at the other end, and I think this is quite a significant departure from anything that's been mentioned so far, you end up getting a test on arrival as well and whisked to a quarantine hotel where basically you only stay um, until that test which you, has been administered on arrival has proved negative. Yeah. And that seems to me to be an additional um, kind of safeguard, but also an additional um, sort of filter that might enable um, uh, sort of foreign travel to open up a little bit more easily and a little bit more qu quickly. Seems like a, a, an important additional stage. It's, it's very interesting, Tim, because Madeira was, which I don't think it's doing at the moment, because, because of it, it, problems complicated by Portugal and, 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 and Brazil. But what Madeira was offering was really you can have a test on arrival free and you actually didn't have, a, have to have a test to get on the plane to go to Madeira so people were actually thinking well I'm not going to pay 150 200 pounds for a test I'll, I'll have a test on arrival um, and some people were then arriving and being found to be positive but they were giving free tests and actually most of the time you, you, were, you were getting the test arriving in the afternoon and you'd get the result before you got up for breakfast the next day. I mean, it was a very efficient process. Um, I, I, I was planning to go to Madeira, but I, I wasn't prepared to get on the plane without having the test. I was gonna have the test before I went, but, it, but it, the whole thing fell, fell through. But it's that sort of approach. And you've got countries like the Maldives now who are saying, well, you can come, but have a test 96 hours before rather than 72 hours. But I think it is this sort of, that you've got to be going, ideally arriving with a negative test, but having another one on arrival to satisfy the, the, the domestic, domestic uh, concerns. Especially in, con in, in combination with a vaccination certificate. Indeed, indeed. I think as much reassurance that you can provide, I mean, the, the vaccination certificates are relatively new, but now they're coming in, that should be part and parcel of the process. I think that's very much, very much the case. Because uh, I think without, without this, uh, there's still going to be a lot of nervousness about uh, um, take, taking people in from countries where you've still clearly got a, a big problem on your hands. And I, I agree very much. Hopefully that's the sort of thing that Thailand is, is thinking about. I think people, the countries that can come out with this and, and, and demonstrate it to work, and of course it's an ongoing process, it will be improved as it, as it goes along. But, it, but those are the assurances that countries themselves want to receive. And I think passengers travelling, because I think uh, people are still a little bit nervous and uh, uh, I think people are very nervous about going into hospital because that's where, if you didn't have it, that's where you could catch it. But the process of travelling is still an area where people are, are, are rather nervous. They, they, they think they may well run an enhanced risk of picking something up, um, uh, either at an airport or, or an aeroplane, because you, you can't really um, ha have a safe distance on a plane at the moment. And when you're in a plane, you're in that plane, you're going to Europe for a few hours. If you're going to Thailand, you're in the plane for... A dozen hours so you know there's every chance if someone on board has got has got the virus it's likely to spread around during the course of that flight but as much reassurance as possible is really what we're looking for you know we do a it's a two test model here you get a test on day seven and a test on day 13 nobody has it on the second test or oh, it, it's such a rarity such a small percentage and when people have uh, been proved positive on the second test it's believed because they were generally, uh, they'd had COVID in the past and there's still some cells left in them that can show, show the test. So I think that one test uh, would be a fantastic way of doing things. On the day you arrive, you've got jet lag anyway. 
So there's no hardship to go and stay in a hotel, get some room service, have a relax and chill out, get your result the next day, and then go on and, and enjoy your time in the country. So fingers crossed that could be one way that would go. And I think the reason they do seven days for the first test here, because they want to see if any symptoms occur. And I think doing it for one night, it's not going to be perfect, but you think, well, if that then takes it down to a 10 or 20% risk, at least it allows us to start. And then we're very good here for the track and trace. So if you have to put, give an app so we can find you if there's any concern, then I think it's a kind of small price to pay to let people back in. There will always be some risk, but that's a good way to start doing it, I feel. No, it takes it, you know, it's along, along, those, along those lines, certainly. Yeah. Any more questions, Andrew? Anyone in the, else in the queue? Greg. Greg? Greg? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, hello, Tim. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, I, my, my sense uh, after being here such a long time is that that's how it will end up rolling out in Thailand. But I don't know, Martin, did you cover vaccine rollout in your earlier comments? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Okay. Because, yeah, I mean, you probably know a bit more than me, but I know it's not quite as advanced as the UK. Yeah, <laughs> nowhere near. I mean, th th this is my concern. I, I honestly can't see... Thailand opening the borders to tourists with whatever protocols um, without quarantine when the vast majority of Thais have not yet had access to a vaccine. That, that just wouldn't seem to, to work for me for reasons of, of face, culture, whatever. And at the moment, we're looking at uh, 2 million of the Sinovac vaccine coming in the next two to three months. But my understanding is that hasn't yet been approved by the Thai FDA. Um, we're looking at the AstraZeneca vaccine, 26 million shots are due to be produced here by mid-year and another 35 million AstraZeneca shots are, be, uh, are due to be delivered. Um, reading uh, what's happening with the AZ shots in, in UK and, and what's happening with the EU, my sense is that that's likely to be uh, delayed more. What we're not seeing in, ter in terms of public sector procurement here is, is the Thai government going for the more expensive shots. Yeah. Um, AZ is about, I think, four to six dollars a shot. The Pfizer Moderna shots are around 25 to 35 dollars a shot. Um, what, was, what did come out a week ago was a comment made by the Prime Minister here that the private sector would be allowed to import approved vaccines. So that obviously um, gives the private hospitals here a chance to get going, but it also relies on the vaccine producers to get that FDA approval. Um, that, that's not Thailand's burden or the private hospital's burden, that's the vaccine companies. So while we see Johnson & Johnson, Novavax and other vaccines coming through, um, Sputnik from Russia, um, we're not seeing them applying for um, FDA approval here. So that, that, can, that really does um, concern me. I, I think my, my final comment in terms of, of the many, many Brits I know who have been through um, quarantine, including the country president here of AstraZeneca, who's done the uh, two-week stint twice now, he's just come out, uh, one with a baby, um, a, an under one-year-old child. Um, they are going through it. Um, the Thai embassy in London they, they are being extremely helpful on even on a one-to-one person-to-person -one, -person basis. Um, I've not heard of any, any horror stories um, uh, trying to get a response and I, I think that's an added benefit um, in the UK. I, I doubt Thais wishing to go to UK would have the same level of uh, personal treatment and uh, mm. no offence to your previous employers, Steve. <laughs> would, would, would you say that <laughs> Thailand's vaccination program plans are sort of typical with the rest of ASEAN? Are, are most of the other countries in a similar situation to that or some more advanced like Singapore or, or whatever? I mean we're not seeing detail on protocols. Mm. Um, yeah. I mean the, the UK protocol is obviously to vaccinate as many people as possible with a single shot. So you get 70% efficacy um, for twice as many people yeah. with two shots as you'd have 95% eff efficacy and that 70% seems to be the, uh, the, the, at least the rollout point. 
Um, we're not, I'm, I'm not reading any media reporting of those sorts of discussions, even starting in Thailand yet. I'm, I'm sure they are privately. Um, but the big challenge I see is, is getting those vaccines in, yeah, and getting, getting them produced, getting them out on the market. And I, I will be absolutely gobsmacked if, if any other than the two million shots from China are available here before mid-year. Mm -hmm. And that sort of that sort of puts into context the Minister of Tourism's and TAT's initiatives yeah, very to much open so. up. Is, is, is AstraZeneca's plans to, to produce in Thailand? Is that, is that part of the agreement? Yeah, 26 million shots. They, they've done a deal with a Thai producer, um, CM Bioscience. Uh, I, I think they, that company will, will need to you know, to invest in their processes yeah. And, yeah. and and facilities. <laughs> no, I'm not medical, John. I just read a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I am. I am really focused on the vaccine rollout issue. I, I think it's crucially important here, um, not just for the safety of of, of of Thai people, but it's that element of allowing yeah. tourists in, which is essential to the economy. Um, that just must be allowed in. Um, no. uh, we, we've had stories of, of ASQ um, on golf courses yeah. to get try to try and get the Japanese, Koreans, and Chinese in because we're, we're linked to the Japanese chamber. We're much closer now than we've ever been with the Japanese chamber, and and their ambassador is saying they have simply thousands of business people wanting to come in on business trips, and and the Japanese are coming in with checkbooks. I mean, it, it's investing in the EEC, expanding their existing operations here. Yeah. And there's only so long that Thailand can resist yeah. Um, yeah. that sort of uh, um, investment money coming in. No, I think, I think your point's a very, very valid one, Greg. Until, until, until the vaccination program within Thailand has started rolling out, uh, let alone who's going to be at the front of the queue, um, it's, not going to, it's not going to reassure the 75% figure that Martin quoted of Thais who actually um, are, are quite comfortable with the borders being closed. They, they need added reassurance. That's one way they'll do it. But from a practical point of view, when is that likely, A, to start, or to, to, to really have got some real momentum? And, uh, you know, uh, we, we've seen the problems that, uh, of people getting vaccination, getting vaccine at the moment, as you say. Whether that's summer would be a big ask, Autumn, even that's a relatively big ask. But I, I think from our perspective and traveling from Europe, assuming everything goes well at this end, you know, it, you're looking at that sort of time scale to be realistic before we, could, we can start thinking about coming, coming back into Thailand. Hopefully, hopefully that'll all fall in place for our next regional tour, but we'll have to, have to wait and see for that in, in the new year. Now, that's a very good point. Anyone else with questions, Andrew, before I just Charlie. draw things to a close? That's lovely. Martin, th th thank you very much again. Sorry. Charlie, Steve, Charlie. Charlie has a question. Go ahead, Charlie. Hi, Martin. How are you? Thanks very much. It's been a while. Uh, it's been ages, yeah. <laughs> Even longer since I've been there in person, obviously. But um, yeah, thanks for that. That was really, really interesting to see. Um, uh, my question, kind of going off the kind of COVID vaccination topic, it's more about um the kind of long-term trends and tourism in thailand so um obviously working for a charity we um see the kind of dark side and negative impact of a lot of tourism um and i was wondering what you think looking into a kind of crystal ball of the future for some of the social issues uh, affecting thai communities um like sex tourism, uh, drug trafficking, human trafficking, things that are all kind of tied in sometimes to a, or linked to a negative uh, tourism and impact. Do you think there will be a kind of long-term social change and maybe um, a benefit to Thai society? Some of these issues might be being disrupted, like the trafficking networks and things like that? Now, Charlie, it's not my <laughs> area of expertise. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I always found uh, the sex tourism industry really fascinating here because I, I've never seen anything quite like it. Uh, and there's certainly a, a cycle of it, it being a lot of people's best option. Not, I don't mean the trafficking part, just people taking the decision to go and work in that industry because 
that they didn't have a lot of other options. Now, with that taken away, maybe you have to go and look for another option. So possibly it might lead to a break in that. Something to be remembered, though, uh, the tourists is only part of the problem. And domestic use of that industry uh, was always huge. You know, I see the street, my hotels on this, a few kind of large entertainment centers that don't get any business from tourism, but do very well. Uh, so as for trafficking, I really don't know in the industry that supports the tourist side of it, I don't know how much of that is trafficked, to be honest. So I really don't, I don't hear a lot about people from other countries. Like I say, I'm, I'm, it's not really my area, but when, when I try to talk to people about it and find out, I always thought the only way you stop it is having some kind of break, because how can you say to people, you can't do this anymore uh, without giving them a second option, without saying, but we'll train you to go and work in another industry. But now maybe this forces it for at least a, a decent chunk, if not all of it. So it does yeah. force something uh, in that way that we wouldn't have had before. Uh, as I think with everything, there's like a, obviously a kind of supply and demand system yes. that happens. And um, I know from uh, working in Patia, because I, you know, you were talking about Patia and how potentially yeah. that leisure um, industry might be slightly more contained and Patia might be almost rebranded as slightly more family friendly than it's kind of got a reputation for being at the moment. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of internal, like domestic trafficking, I guess, so, um, people from the Isan and kind of North and Lao mm. regions um, that are trafficked as in uh, incentivized to move into areas like Patia to work in the sex industry. So, yeah, trafficking is it, yeah, it's quite complex. Um, mm. But I was just thinking this, you know, um, potentially could have, you know, benefits for some of these social issues. Obviously, I know that there's a huge um, domestic demand for um, the sex industry as well. Um, but it's just something that's been coming up a lot in um, some of the articles that I'm reading about like, the long term impacts of change in travel. Um, so, yeah, I just thought that was quite interesting. I did notice that like Poseidon has just closed down. <laughs> and I know, you know, the um, big entertainment industry. Um, complex up in uh, Bangkok. I only know about it because it used to be next to my condos when I was at university there. Um, and I saw that it had closed down. So there's obviously um, a lot of entertainment industries that are not being able to, to sustain business during COVID. I don't know if that's because domestically, as you say, Thais are feeling a little like, as you said, there's that shame about kind mm. of getting COVID. So maybe mm -hmm. they're not interacting yeah. in those um, leisure industries as much and entertainment places but yeah it's an interesting one to think about what the long-term like studies down the line about kind of these issues if there will be a big impact because of this break in tourism or the change in trend yeah uh, just, uh, just just a quick one then then you go I, I see uh, Pepperie Road, where my hotel is, where there used to be a lot more, and Poseidon is just, it isn't far from there. A lot of them have closed. I think some of it is a social change in the fact that um, people who are around kind of 60 uh, would have been, in, in the 60s, when they were younger, it would have been absolutely fine for them as part of a, you know, being in a marriage, for the guy to go and use those places. Mm. Uh, the newer generation, people 20s and 30s, it's absolutely not allowed by the wives and the husbands to go and ha have a couple of hours on the way home from work. So I think there's a bit of a natural, uh, as kind of we have our rise of uh, feminism, uh, it starts to happen a more empowerment for females that they can now say to the husband, you are not going there anymore. Uh, you need to uh, join a golf club or something else. <laughs> but it was interesting after lockdown, uh, there's one of the place nearest to my hotel after lockdown and they reopened, uh, the queue of traffic blocked the road, <laughs> as you saw everyone going back in there. And I think it had been sadly missed uh, by, by a lot of the locals. So yeah, um, but the whole thing, it's a real, really int intriguing to look at the whole industry and how it works and to see what will the difference be. But Pat, I uh, very interesting to see the change. And I think it will always have it to a point, but yeah, I think greatly reduced. But Greg knows more about this than me. Hey, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take the fit here 
my, the, the, the hole that I'm going to dig is, is, is far shallower than Martin's and my shovel is much smaller. Um, <laughs> Um, there's a really good indicator, Charlie, on Patia. There's, um, uh, Patia's been dead in the last six weeks, much more so than it was in the first lockdown. And I, I think countless of those involved in, in those particular industries have gone back to their homes up country. And not, not, just, not just with one suitcase. You know, they've hired pickup trucks to take all their belongings back up country. For them to come back down again without the certainty of, of, of yeah. whatever level of income those industries may provide, I think that that's going to take a, a big, big stretch. So I think mm. positively by accident, some of those dynamics are changing. What is really interesting to me, the Patia Mail reported last week that Walking Street, Walking Street has been completely dead. And now there's a, there's a big, uh, big banner on the top of Walking Street with what Walking Street will look like once it's gentrified. Now, that's probably come from the mayor's office and, and the mayor is, of Patia is a, um, quite an influential person. But there are lots of snouts in the Walking Street troughs and mm. lots of people who have made large sums of money and by no means all of them are, are foreign. So for me, that's going to be a really good indicator of how serious Patia is going to be in terms of, of change. I think elements of it will still exist, um, but, but you know, I've driven, I've driven along that beach road where, where everything is shuttered. I mean, even Central um, was closed during the second lockdown because of the, uh, the closeness of the outbreak. There was an outbreak um, in Chombury province was one of the red zones for a long, long time. Um, yeah, really, really interesting changes. And, you know, if it's gone, it's not going to come back overnight. That's, that's mm. the key element. It's an opportunity for Patia to change and repitch itself, certainly. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. And, uh, another dynamic which we haven't talked about is, is Myanmar and what's happening there and what, what, what impact that's going to have, which we'll have to wait, wait, and, wait and see. But perhaps that's for another time. If there are no more questions, I'd, I'd just hey, like to thank Martin very, very much. It's been a very good session indeed. I think the people have found it particularly interesting. I'd just like to flag up a few more of our un upcoming events. Uh, the next one is on uh, the, the um, 16th of February. This is a, a joint event that we're having with the Asia Scotland Institute. And uh, it's the three, the three speakers or two speakers and, and, and myself. Uh, Brian Davison will be giving an update. Um, so it's a little while since we've heard from Brian. it will be very interesting to hear what, 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 what he has to say as usual. Uh, Chris Cracknell, um, Chairman of the Grant Thornton Thailand, uh, also uh, now the new Chair of the British Chamber of Commerce Thailand, um, and also my former boss, but uh, I think that has very much to, to do with it. But Chris, Chris will be giving a very good um, angle from, from on, the, on, the, on the commercial and economic side. Um, I, I'm down as the third speaker, but I'll be sort of chipping in on, 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 on both sides. But that's on the 16th of, of uh, February. It'll be in the morning as well, because the, Brian and, Char, uh, and, and Chris will be talking from, from Thailand. We've got a talk on the 3rd of March from Paul Bromberg, also a, a Bangkok uh, resident. Uh, Paul will be giving a talk about Thai silverware. Um, um, I, I hopefully there'll be a lot of interest in that, but clearly for some people it'll be more interesting than others. And on March the 17th, we've got another update from Dr. Passanti. I mean, both his, his previous two presentations have been extremely good. And I think at the point that Greg has just raised about the Thai vaccination program, it would be very interesting to see what Dr. Passanti's take is on that, because I think that is a, a pretty key factor in how, how, how we go forward. And then we have got uh, speakers um, penciled in and some confirmed up, up until even, even running into May. But I think if we just concentrate on those next few events. Hopefully a number of you will be able to attend the ones, the, the ones coming up on the, on the 16th and the 3rd and the 17th. But really a big thank you from me to, to Martin. It's been extremely well, much appreciated. And to everybody else for joining us in today. I think it's been a very good start to our 2021 programme. And hopefully this will continue as I've just outlined 
but hopefully it won't continue on a fortnightly basis for too long. I hope uh, we will soon be able to pick a point where hopefully we'll be, all be able to get together face to face. But I think uh, at the moment, that's just very difficult to, to assess when that's going to take place. I'd hoped it'd be by the summer, but even at the moment with all the positive developments, um, it, it's very difficult to sort of nail that down and say yes. But uh, when, it, when it does and when the time comes, um, I think as you all know, we're planning to have a, a welcome back reception. We're hoping to have that at the, the Thai Embassy in London. And it will be really great to see each other face to face and not over the screens as we've had to for so long. But thanks again to Martin. Thanks again to everybody else. Look forward to seeing you again. Thanks very much indeed. Very good.